The year 2018 was a turning point for database design, uh, dividing the history of databases into those that were designed before 2018, uh, before the groundbreaking events of FSync Gate and Protocol Aware Recovery, both in 2018, and those that were designed after. And this year is the fifth anniversary uh, since FSync Gate and Protocol Aware Recovery. And it's an absolute pleasure to have here with us today two people who were involved in both of these events, Ashwarya Ganesan and Ram Alagappan. They both got their PhDs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then did their postdoc at VMware Research. Currently, they are assistant professors at the University of Illinois at Bana champaign Fun fact, they are also my research advisors at UISC. Over the years, Ram and Ashwarya have done phenomenal research at the intersection of distributed systems and storage systems. Thanks a lot for joining us, Ashwarya and Ram. For having us here. Looking forward to the rest of the chat. Yeah. Yeah, definitely our pleasure to be here. Uh, looking forward to the chat. Yeah, so it's it's a huge pleasure to welcome you and also to have Ch Chaitanya Bandari co host this with me. Uh, Chaitanya is our intern at Tiger Beetle, our very first intern. And we were just really, I was surprised because Chaitanya and I were going to have a chat. And the next thing I saw, he was also your student. Uh, and obviously, you know, Tiger, Tiger Beetle uses protocol aware recovery. Um, and, but if we go back in time, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that first moment that I looked at a computer. I saw it unboxed, the 286, and I looked over people's shoulders and I, and, and, and I saw the floppy disks, you know, the world's, I don't know, the, there were storage systems before floppy disks, but um, that, that was my era. And so I somehow, you know, I got into coding and then uh, I'll never forget that journey. But um, I thought before we go into the computer science, we'd just love to know, Ashwarya Ram, you know, what was your journey into coding and computer science? What, what made you feel like this was what you wanted to do? Yeah, maybe I can go first. Uh, I was honestly very, pretty late to programming. Um, so I never had um, like programmed or used computers very uh, uh, largely in my high school life and then I by some chance I I thought I should take computer science in college I, I don't know what reason <laughs> what was the reason then I just went into college and I really sucked at programming um, I was almost flunking the class in C programming in my first year uh, but then um, later my uh, uh, I started love to code it like love love to do coding because of uh, because I started reading algorithms. I started reading algorithms. I read this textbook on uh, the introduction to algorithms. I fell in love with that book. And uh, that was a that was my introduction into actually uh, trying out these algorithms in a real computer and trying to test those things. And that's how I got into programming. So I, it took me a lot of while before I started uh, to code. Um, probably like in my second year in my undergrad, that is when I got serious coding. Uh, but after that, I started, lo I started loving it. It was really uh, something that I enjoyed doing, and then I thought I should do this for my life, and I should become a software engineer. And I did uh, after my undergrad. I was I was a software engineer for three years. Um, I enjoyed doing that, and then I later decided to go to grad school to further build upon these skills. So it it was very similar for me in the sense that I did not really have a lot of experience. Uh, with coding or programming, like during my school days, I I did have like a little bit of exposure. I think I did some sort of basic programming when I was in my eighth grade or so, but then I really did not have any experience till I started my undergrad. My parents wanted me to go into medicine. I wanted to become an aeronautical engineer, but uh, I think luckily I ended up uh, taking uh, computer science. In my undergrad, actually in India, uh, you don't have like a lot of time to explore in your undergrad what your major is going to be. Like when you go start your undergrad, you need to choose your major like right then. I luckily chose CS and then also luckily enjoyed it. And so I think I decided to like stick with it. Like I, I really, really love programming. Like I used to, uh, when I initially learned programming, I used to like come home uh, and then like my father used to work in a bank. And uh, I used to like create like a banking sort of a softwares, like, you know, uh, uh, like a very toyish thing. And then I used to make him like uh, do transactions and like, say, hey, see, I've made it, automated that. 
and then like i really loved that and i decided to like continue with it and yeah now here i am i guess okay so i hope i hope we carrying on your childhood legacy of tracking uh, financial transactions at tiger beetle <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we've got someone in the audience says, ha I'm an aerospace engineer by background. So um, in, in, in good company. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Thanks for that background. Uh, Ram and Ishwara. It's always, it's always nice to know how people start and how they, how they get into uh, the field where, which they eventually choose for the rest of their life. And uh, yeah, even though, Back in India, we don't have too much choice uh, when we enter undergrad. It was, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great, it's great, great to know how it progressed. Um, so uh, so do, during your PhD, uh, how did you end up focusing uh, on the intersection of distributed systems and storage systems? Uh, had your interests been crystal clear before you headed to graduate school? Or did you have to explore around a little bit, explore various fields before uh, finding what you uh, finally wanted to focus on? Yeah, good question. So I think for me, uh, I knew I wanted to do systems uh, because when I was a software engineer, I was building mostly storage systems, uh, network systems. Um, so I, I, I mostly wanted to be a systems person, but I was kind of open to any anything related to operating systems, storage and things like that. Um, but when I, Came to grad school. Um, I found Andrew and Ramsey. I, um, I really liked the way they worked and how they ran their group and their students and everything. And uh, their uh, expertise was on storage systems. So I made myself uh, ready to work on like storage systems. But then I inherently had this interest to work on distributed systems. Uh, so when I started in the group, I wanted to um, explore distributed systems, but have also. Um, have a link on storage so that I, I can use my advisor's expertise to uh, explore this new uh, area that I was exploring on the wall. Uh, so that turned out to be very useful uh, in that like there was this niche intersection that not many people were working on, um, which turned out to be very uh, interesting and useful for me to just work on. So uh, it's just like, it just happens that because I was an anti in this group, I had the storage angle to my uh, distributed systems interest, and that's how I focused to focus on this intersection. For me, uh, I ended up trying out like different areas before I settled on like distributed systems and storage. So before coming to grad school, I did my like grad school in the US. I, I did my master's in India, where I ended up working on like. Uh, databases, uh, not very far from distributed storage systems, but like, yeah, I worked on databases and then I worked in, um, I worked at Microsoft Research India on like mobile computing and like networking. So I tried out like different areas of systems, but then I always had like an interest towards distributed systems and wanted to work on it. And then I ended up in on, under and Ramsey's group. I took uh, Ramsey's distributed systems course uh, and I love distributed systems and I wanted to continue working on it. But given that like Ante and Ramsey worked predominantly in the storage systems, I wanted to work at the intersection. I guess like similar to Ram right there. Uh, that's how I started working in distributed systems and the intersection of distributed systems and storage. <clears throat> that's awesome to hear. So I think I've always thought like distributed systems are hard, but then there's this, this, um, this vortex that sucks you into the gravity of distributed storage systems and storage storage always scares me because you know you store people's data like and 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 you can't stop you know you just have to just store it forever you you don't get a break and it's all the complexity of distributed systems with the gravity of user data that you cannot lose um, so i think that 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 intersection is um hard mode um, <laughs> yeah uh, yeah. And if we want to dial up hard mode, then I guess we can talk about now we can come, you know, to, to the paper protocol aware recovery, but also like the surround your surrounding research around that. Um, and you know, the research on storage faults, you know, you get latent sector errors where sectors can become temporarily or permanently partitioned and you get like an EIO error back, or you can get, um, you know, silent corruption, um, there's also misdirected IO, but this research around these things, it, it you know, people might say, 
Um, sure, the research dates back to 2008, um, maybe earlier even. Um, uh, you know, so we've had file systems like ZFS, um, which is awesome um, since then. And, it, it, you know, people might say it's a solved problem, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so what motivated you to revisit uh, these storage faults 10 years later uh, in 2018 in the context of distributed storage systems? How did you spot the gap or the gaps um, in, you know, in distributed storage systems? And you thought, well, um, we need more research in this field. <laughs> Yeah, so like actually this all started, I think, for for me, like back in 2015. That's when like uh, Ram and I started working together with uh, Andre and Remzi. So I took a class with uh, Remzi on distributed systems, as I mentioned earlier. And for the course project, we thought like there are like a lot of uh, distributed storage systems that are getting really popular out there and they're getting mature and like somebody needed to analyze how these systems uh, can deal with like different problems and it all started out as like a simple investigation we wanted to see for example like if we inject a corruption into one of these distributed storage systems how would they react it was mo it just started out as a simple investigation for the course project and it turned out that we it we found like many interesting problems and then we wanted to continue working on it. And then maybe Ram can talk a little bit about like the other line of work that he uh, he did before corruption. Yeah, so uh, right when I show you, this, as I should have mentioned, this started as a very modest investigation into just like, let's go and analyze how distributed storage systems are reacting to these well-known problems, right? As Joran mentioned, this is like a, not a new problem. People have been studying it for many years um, before us. And we just wanted to see uh, if these new systems carry uh, some of the lessons uh, from the prior research into how they are built, right? And uh, when we did that investigation, we found that that was not the, that was not the case. Like, these uh, systems still had a problem. And one of the unique angles about looking at this problem in the distributed storage context is that some of the solutions that were proposed in the prior research doesn't necessarily apply readily to distributed storage systems. For example, you can have like some complex mechanisms to handle with local corruptions and errors and things like that in the local storage stack. But in the distributed storage system, you don't need that uh, because you have this inherent redundancy in the system at the high level, uh, the higher layers. So you can actually use, continue to use very weak local storage stacks that don't actually tolerate a lot of errors and corruptions and things like that, but then you can use the inherent redundancy to fix these problems. So that, that unique, that angle was sort of unique. And uh, to be honest, this this was kind of like hinted in the MapReduce paper and the Google file system paper even, right? Like the Google file system paper says that, oh, we would use these cheap IE disks which would often corrupt the data, but then we had these chunk servers which are replicated and therefore we can deal with some of these issues. But then like this kind of knowledge of using distributed redundancy to fix local problems was like in the heads of pro probably like a few engineers and it was not kind of like democracy. And it was kind of like some people knew it and how to deal with these problems. But we conducted this first um, systematic study of how systems actually build, how people actually build these systems and how we can make them better. And uh, this intersection of storage and distributed systems, we came at it at different angles. Like one of the things that we were looking at is corruptions. Of course, that, 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 turned, that turned out to be a very interesting uh, body of research in itself. But then we were also looking at crash consistency. Like for example, there is like a bunch of crash consistency techniques that storage systems, local storage systems use. And how do they uh, work in a distributed setting? Uh, it's kind of like not known. Um, and then we also started some research into that. And we had a paper back in 2016, uh, well before this corruption line of study started, um, where we analyzed how the crash consistency protocols in a distributed systems work. And we showed many problems even with crash consistency where popular systems would lose data, corrupt data, things like that. Uh, that's how it all started. So even though the problem was to uh, go back to your own yeah. question, so even though the problem was like sort of old, uh, revisiting in the context of new systems that were getting popular and mature and way widely being used, um, gave us new insights and new directions to uh, conduct this research. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And of course, like being in uh, Andre and Rindri's group, and like building upon their like prior work on like iron file systems uh, from 2005, like that was oh, yeah. another definitely like a big factor, right? Like uh, because we were in their group and we were interested in distributed systems, we wanted yeah. to sort of 
look into that again in the context of distributed systems. So yeah, I guess I they call us that. Yeah, I remember one of the post sessions at FAST where we were presenting this uh, redundancy work. Somebody came to us and then said like, your group did 2000 uh, INFS in 2005 and what took you so many years to do this for distributed storage this is exactly the question that uh, you're on getting at so yeah it it had to be like we were sort of lucky to be in the right time where these systems were getting mature and everybody was using to store lots of data and uh, we had this uh, knowledge from Andrew and Prince's group that storage falls are sort of like very problematic and gave us an opportunity to explore in the context of new class of systems Oh, that's that's really great to hear. I wanted to ask, um, which were the you know these newer modern systems that you looked at? Um, just just quickly before Chaitanya dives into into that paper right. that you you published on that. I, I can I can name some systems. We uh, started with Cassandra, I think that was the first yeah. system that we tested. Then we tested MongoDB, uh, tested Kafka, we tested uh, CockroachDB was one other uh, example. We tested some a couple of RAP-based systems. I think Log Cabin was the one. Uh, we tested Zookeeper. Uh, overall, we tested like ten systems, I think, across uh, in our in our initial study. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember all of them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think like maybe Redis was one another system that we did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think like yeah, as Ram mentioned, across these two studies, we uh, we did analyze about around ten or so people. Uh, systems. Yeah, that's a pretty cool list as well. You know, um, it's the who's who. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it it is the who's who, but I, I I think what was more important was the fundamental insights that came out of that study. So uh, I think it's time to dive a little deeper into that. Um, so protocol aware recovery, it's it's really two papers, right? Uh, it's the follow up to uh, your paper uh, that got it all started, which was redundancy does not re uh, imply fault tolerance. And uh, this is surprising because I think many developers just assume that, okay, we have redundancy or we have replication or say we have RAID um, that should simply imply fault tolerance. We should be tolerant to all of these kinds of failures. But it was your work that asked the questions, does it really though? Um, so as part of this study, you craft open uh, all of these popular open storage, uh, storage systems uh, and injected storage faults into their on-disk structures. Um, could you now tell us a little bit more about what you found and mm -hmm. how, how bad was it? Yeah, I can uh, tell a bit about it. So, um, so when we started uh, looking at these distributed storage systems and wanted to inject these storage faults, we wanted to start with like a very simple model. So we wanted to say, hey, we are going to just inject like one fault at a time. So we're going to pick like one data structure and then we just on the structure and then just introduce like one fault and like have the system be configured in a strong mode, like where replica, all the replicas being updated in the synchronous path of writes. And we wanted to see how these systems reacted, right? And what we found is like, even when you introduce like single fault, and even when like the data was successfully replicated and was present on many copies, even a single fault could lead to devastating scenarios. For example, a single corruption in one of the nodes could lead to data loss, or a corruption in one of the nodes could spread into other replicas that were not really corrupted to begin with, which you could have used actually to recover from this corruption. Right. And of course, there were other also other problems where like you would have more crashes and sometimes it would lead to unavailability and so on. Right. So these are like some of the effects. Right. And when we looked at all of these systems, what we found was there was no one systematic way of recovering from these storage faults. Right. Each of these systems had like their own way of doing so. Like some would like, for example, not even have checksums. So they would have like problems like corruptions and like corruptions spreading to other nodes. Some systems would have checksums, but then they would end up taking like incorrect actions leading to data loss and so on. So there was like no really one systematic way of, you know, recovering from storage faults. And the other lesson that we uh, like sort of came up with was people didn't really like, these systems didn't really use redundancy to properly recover from the problems, right? So I guess like those were the, two major lessons for us. And of course, like we also had like some other less, uh, ways that like, people got it wrong. 
one of the interesting things that we had was like how systems would not properly distinguish corruptions and uh, crashes, right? Like, so corruptions could be caused by uh, like storage corruptions, right? But it also could be caused by, for example, like a, when you're writing something to disk and you crash in the middle due to a power loss, then your data could be corrupted. So systems wouldn't properly distinguish between these two, and then that could lead to some problems. And that was sort of also common across many systems. And Ashwarya, if, just to check if, if I understand or to really hit this nail on the head with a hammer. Uh, so you're saying that obviously, you know, you would just inject a single um, corrupt sector on one node and maybe the replication or consensus would actually spread it to others. And then yeah, some, yeah. Yeah, some systems didn't have check thumbs, so for sure they, they couldn't handle it. But then even the systems that had check sums, because I think this will be surprising to people is our, our intuition as developers is, well, if you're dealing with corruption, checksums will solve it. And, and, and I, I assume that these systems did use checksums as checksums should be used, um, but yet you, you were still finding data loss. So I think this is mm -hmm. the pu puzzle, you know, that, that people are, are, are right. Th this is what we'll dive into. You know? uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, to give an example, right? Uh, so people would use checksums. They would detect the problem, but the action that they took upon a checksum mismatch was the was incorrect. Right? So, for example, one of the popular action was to truncate the uh, uh, corrupted data from the local disk on just of one replica. And because how this local action of truncating the data interacted with the high level protocols, like the high layer protocols, like replication or some other protocols like uh, uh, used to uh, fix uh, lagging nodes in the system and things like that, that would take this local data loss and spread the data loss to others. And we saw this kind of behavior on many in many systems. Yes, so, so maybe some nodes would truncate the corruption locally, and then other nodes would, would copycat and say, okay, well, I see, I see right. your data loss, exactly. uh, and I raise you more data yeah. loss. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we've got a question on from the audience. So, how were faults injected? Oh, that's an interesting question. So, uh, we developed a fuse file system. So, because we are interested in like how applications are dealing with uh, faults, um, so we introduced a a, files, a user level file system in all operations. We would configure the database to run on top of this file system. And our file system, uh, it's a very, pretty simple file system that we built in like three or four days. Um, what it does is it just like all, all the rights and reads go through the file system and then we eventually choose one uh, block that's corrupted. And then before returning the data block to the file, up to the application, we would just tune up the bits uh, and then just give it to the application and then see how the application reacts to it. Okay. And just, just before we continue, so on this work, um, you, you you looked at 10 systems. I take it like most of them all survived and maybe you, you found, you know, catastrophic data loss with just one of the 10? Uh, no, uh, I think it was uh, some of them survived. Most of them had catastrophic problems. Uh, okay. so I think that, that, that was my recollection. I think uh, uh, yeah. some of the some of the battle tested systems uh, like Zookeeper had fewer problems. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Zookeeper, Log Cabin had fewer problems. Some of the more popular systems had somewhat yeah. surprising problems uh, leading to data corruption and data loss. Okay, so off, actually it wasn't just one problem with most of the systems, but most of the systems had multiple problems. Some more severe, yeah. but right. still, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like other, some, we also found like things, other interesting things, right? Like, uh, for example, like one interesting problem that we found was like in Zookeeper, like on a fault, on a fault, uh, only one of the threads would crash. But like, the, let's say in the, in when you have a replicated system uh, to ensure that like the leader would uh, ping the other nodes uh to ensure that the other nodes are alive right like so that you that is usually like a heartbeat thread running so in zookeeper when we injected one of the problems uh the heartbeat thread was still running but like the main transaction processing thread died so this, the system would look as if everything is fine like yeah. when uh the replicas are pinging each other like but 
transactions wouldn't go through. So actually, the system was unavailable, but in real, uh, but when you for the other replicas that were inspecting each other, the system looked fine. So we also found like things that were not really directly related to like corruptions or data loss, but also problems like these. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, that's fascinating. So, it, I, I, you know, I, I was aware of all the storage research coming out of Wisconsin Madison. I followed the, I, I, same as you, I love distributed systems. And somehow I saw this fast conference where it's like, oh, yes, distributed systems <laughs> and storage, you know, and uh, storage <laughs> systems. So I started following that conference every year. And I, I started to see, you know, Wisconsin Madison, Ramsey, Andrea, Apache, so. And so I was reading all the papers and I remember reading protocol aware recovery, you know, the first time when you won best paper at fast in 2018. Uh, and so in July, 2020, you know, we, I was sitting down, we were designing the sketching out the design of tiger beetle. And it was interesting timing because UW Madison had also just released, um, can applications recover from F sync failure? This was, you know, looking at the aftermath of F-Sync Gate, which was two years before. Obviously, everybody had patched their systems, MySQL, Postgres, like everybody had the fix. And then Wisconsin Madison, you know, checked like, well, did they fix it properly, you know, two years later? And turns out that they hadn't because, you know, that was all about the kernel page cache can become not no longer coherent with what's on disk. So... Actually, if you want to know if a database can handle F-Sync gate, litmus test is, does it use direct IO to recover from the write ahead log at startup? You know, is it making decisions on durable data? Um, so that that paper was interesting, 2020, because we were starting Tiger Beetle. I, I already knew we were going to do um, direct IO. Um, it, it made sense. Um, uh, so, but at the same time, you know, it was, it had been two years since I read protocol aware recovery and I was speaking to myself, you know, in the back of my head. And I said, you know, you should really go and read that paper protocol aware recovery again. Cause I remember, you know, the first time I read it, it was a bit confusing. There was like Paxos consensus or raft, you know, and, and, but I, I knew it was a good paper. So I actually did, you know, I, I went and, um, read it again and I'm so glad I did because you know your paper protocol aware recovery um it's influenced tiger beetle massively so much of the design um you know has been influenced by protocol recovery even in small little ways you know so that obviously there's the big the big ways you know we've we've started touching on this but how do you use the redundancy of the global consensus protocol to heal local storage faults in the local storage engine um, and then how do you maximize durability? Even how do you optimize for high availability? You know, so correctness, high availability, both important. Um, but then there's these little gems in the paper towards the end, you know, um, like um, just the, the tip that if you're going to design a, a data file format for each node of the cluster, make it that it's deterministic across the cluster because then you can start to do um, you know, recovery, which is accelerated because you no longer have to transfer massive data files. You can just transfer at the block level, just a single sector. Um, so this, this tip that, you know, make your file format deterministic across the cluster. Um, so yeah, it would be great to dive into all of these now, the, the paper, you know, um, you know, the, the, the big ideas on correctness, availability, and also the small optimizations so over to you, Ashwari and Ram, like maybe can you walk us through, you know, what is protocol aware recovery and what are the goals, the big goals that it optimizes for? Yeah. So when we started this project, uh, we wanted to, we didn't have this idea of protocol. Level. So we had this lessons that, oh, existing systems are bad. We need a way to uh, recover from uh, storage corruptions. And of course, like the first question that many people said is, this is probably a solved problem. You put in RAID in each of these missions, you should be fine. Or you can probably say something like, oh, you detect the problem and then you delete this node's data and then you should be fine um, and all of these things. Uh, but then like we found at least one problem with the, all of the existing approaches and sort of like annoying things. Like for example, this idea of like reconfiguration where if you find out that some node's data is corrupted, 
you can reconfigure the system uh, and then add a new node to the system in place of the old node. It's, it is a reasonable approach, I would say, but it does not work for storage systems though. Uh, like for example, if you, let's, let's say you have a file system, a large file system, which has terabytes of data as your state machine, then uh, this approach is not the optimal one because you're amplifying the error so much because the, the amount of data that is corrupted is very minuscule compared to the entire state mission size. So we thought there should be something more surgical that we can do. And of course, like when you're doing these things, like correctness is of course the most important thing. We we wanted the protocol to ensure correctness no matter, no matter what, right? Like in all sorts of scenarios with uh, partitions, crashes and storage faults, uh, we needed correctness to be absolutely uh, guaranteed. And uh, uh, the other uh, important thing that we wanted to do is to maximize availability. So I'm not saying guarantee availability because in some situations uh, you cannot guarantee availability. And for example, if the same piece of data is corrupted on all of the missions, which is highly unlikely, but if it happens, the uh, system has to remain unavailable. Uh, there is no other way. So we wanted to produce a maximum of availability. And in addition to these two big goals, uh, if you said something like, okay, we can give you safety, we can give you availability, but if system is going to be five minutes slower, nobody's going to find the solution. Uh, so we wanted to have the common case performance overhead to be really, really minuscule. So if you, you cannot do some heavyweight operations in the critical part of your application protocol or when you're writing to the storage device. So we want to uh, be a, it to be a very practical solution, which has the minimal performance overhead. And and of course, in addition to these three goals, uh, one other interesting goal uh, which we had was simplicity. Um, in that, uh, for example, like our snapshot recovery protocol, which uh, Yoran talked about, which is basically we ensure a deterministic snapshot procedure where all these snapshots across replicas are similar, so that you can do this um, minuscule, uh, sorry, fine granular recovery. Um, maybe I, I I kind of suspected when we were designing this protocol, I should I used to argue that. Maybe there is a more efficient way to do this recovery, but this is the simplest, but gives you the most efficient recovery. So we optimize for simplicity there, saying that, okay, this is much more simple to argue and reason about, uh, and probably also lends to a simpler implementation uh, so that it becomes somewhat more practical. Uh, of course, we are, we are sure that like there may be more smarter people who can come up with like a better uh, snapshot algorithm, but we wanted to do something that's simple and also efficient. Um, so those are the kinds of like criteria that we had in our uh, mind when we were designing the solution. Yeah, I can just, I don't know, Ashwari, if you want to comment, but I can just add that, you know, on the snapshot protocol for deterministic snapshots across the cluster, okay. when we read that in the paper, we took it as a, as a symbol, uh, like write uh, LSM storage engine, where the LSM does compaction deterministically and you get incremental snapshots without a big um, slow snapshot to disk. But the important thing is the principle, you know, that your on disk format mm -hmm. is deterministic, no, ma no matter your storage engine. But we just ran, you know, you, you wrote that that line in the paper and we ran with it and said, well, let's make a deterministic <laughs> LSM storage <laughs> engine. So thanks. But it's really sort of, you know, very great to see that it, this works in like well in practice, right? Like uh, even for, as you mentioned, like very big state machines like LSMs that would have like huge data, huge amounts of data in that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think one of the other details in the paper that was fascinating, that's also influenced Tiger Beetle's design. So Rohan raises it in the questions. Uh, he says, how frequently do faults happen to inodes? you know, file system metadata. Um, how do you detect if the metadata is broken or the data itself? Right. Uh, so, yes, metadata is also sort of like prone to these kind of failures, right? Uh, but luckily, one good thing about metadata is that if you take a large file system partition, the amount of metadata um, that the file system maintains in comparison to the data block, um, it, it is vanishingly very small. So the probability that these blocks are affected by uh, data corruption or a misdirected write uh, naturally is lower than like the probability for data blocks, which is good. Um, but at the same time, um, we are dealing with safety here, so we cannot take chances. So we need mechanisms to protect even against these uh, um, very um, like sort of uh, uh, rare failures. So in the paper, we discussed like how uh, you can um, 
tackle like inode corruptions. Like for example, if the file size field of the inode is corrupted, therefore the file appears smaller or larger, then how do you detect that? Um, or if the file, let's say uh, uh, inode is corrupted and the file system has some internal mechanisms to fix or move um, corrupted inodes into an orphan directory or something like that, then you could have a file that is uh, that has vanished from the device. And therefore it, it might look like your log has a big hole in the middle because that file was actually the one that was containing that portion of the log. Um, so we had some uh, mechanisms to deal with these cases as well. Um, of course, like there are some things that we are expecting from the file system to do well. Like for example, we cannot do much about like a file system super block being corrupted. Uh, the file system is supposed to do, take care of its own data structures. Um, so it can use uh, internal redundancy to uh, protect its own data structures, like the super block, the discrete blocks, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So just to add to Ram's point, like not really related to like file systems, but uh, related to the local redundancy. So there are like some data structures that you cannot really recover from other copies, right? For example, information like voting uh, in the context of uh, consensus like systems, you need to have voting, voting information durably recorded or like term information durably recorded. And these are things that you cannot really rely on other nodes. Uh, so for such very small data structures that are really, really critical and which you cannot rely on other nodes, we have local redundancy. Okay, yeah, we, we also saw that in the paper and we just took that to saying, well, file systems don't have a storage fault model and therefore actually it'll just be easier for us if we skip POSIX and file systems, let's just work with a raw block device and have our own, uh -huh. you know, simple super block mm -hmm. where we where all our critical, you know, log, write ahead log sizes, like, we control that with read and write forums. Mm -hmm. So we actually just designed Tiger Beetle as a file system, just run on a raw block device. It will be simpler, mm -hmm. you know, easier. Um, yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I truly, I mean, it sounds funny, but I think it is actually easier. It, it did, it was much quick, <laughs> quicker, you know, than trying to fix <laughs> physics. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's true. Cool. Thanks for that uh, amazing background. So now that we've uh, built our way up to what protocol aware recovery is and uh, what are the goals that it maximizes for and why it is the correct and optimal solution for dealing with storage faults. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you approached designing the protocol? Mm -hmm. uh, what were some challenges and hitches that you faced along the way? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, talk about that a bit. Uh, so. As you know, like we had this other paper, right? Like before we started protocol of recovery, we had all of these learnings from redundancy, the redundancy of our, uh, redundancy does not uh, imply fault tolerance paper. So we had all of these learnings and we wanted to come up with like a way to solve uh, this problem for like all different kinds of systems. So when we initially started, we started discussing, maybe can we build like some sort of a tool, you know, that you could run that would fix corruption, detect and fix corruptions based on redundancy uh, on other nodes. But soon we realized that uh, that might not be the correct way. For example, like one way you could have fixed uh, a corruption would be to have a tool that detects the corruption and then maybe uses the same, deletes the uh, data on that node and like fetches the data from some other copy and copies it over and then like start as if nothing happened. But all of these tools that sit externally could end up creating problems. For example, let's say you have a system uh, like Zookeeper where you, it's sufficient for you to just replicate on a majority to consider some write successful, right? And then let's say one node in this majority got corrupted and you ended up deleting the data on that node and copying the data from some other node that was lagging onto this node, then you would now create a majority of nodes that don't have the data, and then that would lead to data loss, right? So any tool that you build external to the system and doing something ad hoc might result in problems. So I guess that's where we came up with this idea of like protocol aware recovery, that your recovery mechanism needs to be very much aware of the underlying update protocol or underlying redirection protocol and needs to be like built into the system, right? It, it, you cannot really have like some external tool sitting and fixing these problems. You really need to have like a protocol that also deals with storage faults, like it would deal with crashes and corrupt 
partitions right like these are built into the protocol so similar to that we need to actually built in storage fault tolerance into these protocols and that's how we uh, part started yes and after that we sort of thought like okay we let's focus on one important <clears throat> class of systems which is consensus uh, based systems and then we designed corruption tolerant replication which is specific to uh, consensus based systems Maybe Ram can add uh, some of the challenges that we had. Yeah, uh, some of the challenges that we started were um, we wanted to build a comprehensive protocol that works for a um, like a more realistic storage fault model. Right? So we analyzed many real file systems and devices, and then came up with this reasonable fault model that captures more the behavior of most file systems and devices that are being used today. Um, that did not just include data corruptions, it also included things like errors being written to applications when the file system uh, suspected that there was a uh, corruption in the block being written or read. Uh, for example, ButterFS internally uses checksums even for data blocks, um, and it would return an error, not written um, uh, uh, corrupted data access to applications, uh, but instead it would return an error. So we, we had to come up with like this model and we wanted the protocol to work against this model and then ensure safety against this, this entire model that we built. So that was kind of the most uh, sort of challenging pro uh, part of the protocol where we had to make it work for all of these uh, cases where it's not just data corruptions, but also errors um, and other, other sorts of errors that the file systems can throw to applications. Yeah, making, making a generic word it, it does sound like the biggest challenge and right. uh, uh, the, the clean separation that you made between, for example, what you touched on before, the meta info where you sort of abstracted out all of the protocol aware uh, stuff that has to be durable on the disk. You need to uh, recover that in a separate fashion. You can't use the global redundancy yeah. for that. Um, and that's one thing that I really liked about the paper that uh, like the, the most generic fashion uh, you could capture the essence of all the protocols that uh, have, have these yeah. things. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, redundancy does not imply fault tolerance. Uh, it got nominated for the best paper at FAST 17. In the very next year, protocol aware recovery, you put that paper out, it received the best paper award at FAST 18. And you could have almost have taken a break from FAST 19 to be polite and just give the other papers a chance right <laughs> but, uh, but um talking about industry adoption a little bit um are there any other systems apart from tiger beetle that you're aware of that have integrated uh, protocol aware recovery or some other works that have uh are follow-ups to it uh that's great uh that's a good question so um yeah first of all i have to give credits to tiger beetle for paying attention to research uh, that happens in academia. Uh, not many companies are uh, like paying attention to uh, some deep research that's happening and pu being published at like academic conferences. Um, when some people do, it's it not only like improves the uh, the product that they're building, but it also gives us encouragement that somebody cares, uh, then we should keep going and we should keep doing more of the stuff. Uh, so that was, uh, I, I wanted to really thank them thank for that. Uh, and, Apart from Tiger Beetle, I think um, there was an academic paper uh, after Power, which was published in ATC 19 or 20, which talked about um, similarly, similar to protocol aware recovery, it talks about how to uh, use the distributed redundancy to fix local problems. But one of the interesting angles that the paper brings in is how to use this technique to extend SSD lifetimes. Uh, that uh, SSDs, uh, in the future generation SSDs are now packing more and more bits and they are more prone to errors. The, the number of write cycles that you can survive is actually reducing over time. Uh, so the trend is that you will get more and more errors with future uh, newer SSD devices. So they uh, sort of like uh, solve the problem and then use the same sort of approach where you can say, oh, you can allow the local SSD to have more errors. But given that you have the distributed redundancy, you can use to fix the local problems and before you can use the SSDs uh, for a longer lifetime, right? You can extend the lifetime of these devices, which, which I thought was very interesting. Um, in a way, uh, like we did not, like the original power paper did not focus a lot on like extending the uh, device lifetimes. 
uh, but it was but it was in, in retrospect we, when we thought that oh that that's also an application for the solution that we're building right that that's also a motivation uh, so which was kind of neat. Uh, I think that system um, was used to improve the HDFS. I think the HDFS installations within uh, Facebook, uh, if I'm not wrong. And also, I think uh, an installation of RocksDB, a replicated version of RocksDB, uh, where they had like RocksDB running on each of the nodes, and then it was uh, replicated using Paxos. Uh, I should really want to add something to that. Yeah, I think like just to add to the point regarding uh, extending device lifetimes, right? Like with future SSDs, where you're packing like more and more bits, like you're gonna get like more errors much sooner than you would get like on uh, an SSL, SLC device. For example, in QLC device, it's almost uh, impossible to sort of write many a lot of data into it. So people tend tend to use that as like read-only devices. But with techniques like uh, PAR or where you use uh, redundancy to recover from all of these uh, errors, you could ex extend device lifetimes and you could also pack more bits so you could be more efficient. So I guess that's really great. Uh, and that's a really great uh, advantage of uh, using redundancy. Yes. So it, errors, if I understand correctly, errors are gonna increase more and more and we're gonna pay more and more attention to research as to how to <laughs> use with global replication. You know? So at the same time, you know, we, we've come across some instances where engineers raise objections about protocol recovery. You know, mm -hmm. they say, so, and I think sometimes it's because they're working on older systems, you know, before 2018, mm -hmm. um, before F-Sync gate, um, you know, when database storage systems had a crash consistency model, but not really an explicit storage fault model. You know, if they, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, but I think even for newer systems, you know, sometimes I'm I'm really surprised. You know, when when someone knows about protocol aware recovery and and turns a blind eye, you know, and they they say surely protocol aware recovery is just an optimization, or why not RAID? Why not dial up local redundancy? And I always just say, well, read the paper again. You know, because it, it's a it's the kind of paper that rewards. You know, you've got to work through the, the storage fault examples. Um, but I think it's especially important, you know, because protocol aware recovery is saying, you know, consensus systems are mission critical. They power mm -hmm. like everything. And the storage for these systems like really, really matters, you know. So and here you have research, you know, where you've got these latent correctness flaws um, that you found, you know, this black swan event, it can cause you know global cluster data loss just from one disk on one node failing and yet not everyone in the room is listening so what what are people missing you know as designers of the protocol what have, you know what have you heard and how would you nudge nudge these people out of complacency i i guess you already have you know just to say well in future number of errors is going to increase <laughs> yeah that's a very deep question actually so um, as Yoran mentioned, like prior systems that were built, like that are kind of like old that are already built, um, we kind of agree with their view that like overhauling their existing designs to incorporate something new is sort of very complex, right? And then they want to find other ways to uh, deal with these kinds of problems. And for even for newer systems, uh, when we talk about pro protocol recovery, one of the things that we have, uh, we often come up with, uh, or developers often come up with is like, Oh, we deal with uh, deal with that problem by using reconfiguration, or we use rsync to sync the files between uh, two replicas when there is a problem like this. Um, or sometimes, like people will say, uh, this is why uh, Byzantine fault tolerance protocols were built, and you should use them to tolerate these kind of failures. Uh, so all of these solutions that people propose uh, uh, as a replacement to protocol level recovery, uh, they are they are legit approaches. Uh, Sometimes those are the ones that you should be using. But what we are arguing for is that you don't need this heavy weight mechanisms. For example, take reconfiguration. As I mentioned earlier, it kind of like amplifies the error so much. Right? If there is a, a little bit of fault uh, in one of the pieces of data, you can do some surgical fixing to address that problem. And take, for example, BFT protocols. Um, they are expensive. Uh, they are very expensive to, uh, in terms of performance, in terms of reasoning about correctness in terms of maintaining the code and everything, right? Uh, so uh, there is like better choices you can make. So that's how we would nudge. And uh, yeah. of course, like some of the approaches that developers uh, suggest like using rsync between replicas, it's it's uh, simply incorrect. 
uh, you cannot do that. Uh, so <laughs> it's not just about a performance kind of thing. Sure. It's also like a safety concern, right? Yeah. So if you're yeah. storing financial transactions and things like that, like like Tiger Beetle, uh, that's not, you should not be doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think like the other pushback that we get is like, why not just use like some local techniques or for example, like have have a checksum, detect a problem and then like just crash the node. Or like why not put just read on each of the replica that's running. Those things could work, but like when you're running like thousands of instances of like these, uh, uh, let's say you're running thousands of instances of Raft, which we know that many places do, then you cannot be like manually introspecting like all of these problems that's happening in each of these uh, replicas, right? Like for, yes, check some uh, corruptions are there, but then when you have like so many instances running, they become more frequent. And as I, as I mentioned, like with these more uh, newer devices, right? Like you're bound to see these problems more often now. And so it's better to deal with that in a systematic manner. And then again, like with things like RAID, you're also, uh, it, it's also not efficient on the storage space, right? Like, so you already have a distributed redundancy and on top of that, if you have like local redundancy, you're just paying so much more cost to tolerate this. You could just build a uh, recovery into the protocol to deal with these failures instead of like paying more storage costs. And when you're storing like huge amounts of data, uh, that that's just inefficient to use local redundancy plus distributed redundancy for things that you could use distributed redundancy for. Yes. yes. So well, one final pushback that we got also got from developers was that, oh, you're really talking about systems that store metadata. Um, mm. So these metadata stores tend to be very, very small. So the cost that we're paying in terms of extra storage uh, is not so high. But the answer to that is that uh, with more and more applications requiring strong consistency from replicated databases. Even data plane systems are in the future going to use like strongly consistent protocols like Paxos or Raft or anything to maintain replicated data consistency. So it's not just going to be metadata, even your data plane data, which is your main data is going to be uh, stored in like uh, strongly consistent systems. And in that case, um, that argument is no more valid because like you now have humongous amounts of data which are being replicated on multiple missions and uh, you're already paying like 5x or 3x the cost. Um, so why make it like uh, 6x or 10x, right? Uh, so, yeah. Exactly. And I think even, you know, for those critical metadata systems, which just metadata in a raft, um, you know, system Paxos or raft, the, you know, protocol aware recovery also showed that if you handle these faults wrong, you can actually have global cluster data loss. You can, you can mm -hmm. actually, it's it's not, you know, if we put optimality aside and efficiency aside, you could actually lose all your metadata if if you right. don't implement the protocol aware recovery. Um, if if you true. don't, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think, I think that, another, another sort of angle. Oh, over to you, Chaitanya. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just saying that another sort of angle uh, to look at this from would be bringing that uh, device lifetime argument into context when someone says That's that true. the reconfiguration approach is in fact correct because you're just bringing in a new node well you're uh, yeah first you are transferring so much data into it which is needless and also that uh, same argument about device lifetimes you, when you can just transfer a single block to fix that failure why transfer a huge amount of data to do that yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is always something that uh, data center operators and systems, or people who operate bigger systems, would always uh, like. Yeah. So something that really struck me in like a few months ago is that, you know, Paxos and Raft are famous for their formal proofs. You know, they're they're, they're really like that's their claim to fame. You yeah. know, the, there's a proof for Paxos, there's a proof for Raft, and yet the the formal proofs have a network fault model and when it comes to the storage fault model it just says this formal proof relies on the assumption that stable storage is perfect and that that mm -hmm. is the proof and if you if you put a disk sector fault there paxos and raft are no longer correct or view stamp replication with stable storage same same problem 
But I thought, you know, th this, if you take a step back, protocol aware recovery is so groundbreaking, not only in the application of correctness efficiency, but just this principle that, you know, co design, how you think of like global consensus and local storage engine, how you co design these systems. Like co-design is actually going to impact formal verification. It's no longer enough just to do formal verification of components without systems thinking. We have to actually start to write our formal proofs of the whole system, which is what, what you did. You know, that's what, what you looked at. Storage systems, let's analyze the whole system for correctness, not just the individual components. And you actually found with protocol recovery, you found a way to hack formal proofs and say, no, the formal proof for these consensus protocols, actually, it, there's a gap there um, because it, did, it didn't model stable storage. So anyway, it's thanks, to, thanks to you because that's just, um, yeah, it, it really changes things, you know, um, beyond just, just these practical implementations like Tiger Beetle or uh, HDFS. Yeah. yeah, so one thing that I want to come out about like formal verification is that, uh, of course, we are co-designing these layers. The, the higher layer is now more aware of the exact fault model that the storage layer is going to have. But um, in the form of verification side of things, like people would like to keep abstractions and they want to have, say, uh, they want to have something like, okay, this layer promises this as an axiom to the layer above. And this layer promises a set of axioms to the layer above and so on. And then they can model it as their verification approach. Um, and that seems to be like a very successful technique and people desire to do that. And I think um, uh, protocol event recovery or any uh, protocol that, uh, for the matter, which co-designs layers does not necessarily break, break with abstraction is what I feel. The, the thing about abstractions is that you want to, in, in protocol event recovery, let's say if you're modeling protocol event recovery and trying to verify a system that uses this uh, approach, um, we are not saying that you have to like reason about these layers together. But rather, what we're saying is the storage layer's contract has changed. It's not that you will always get the exact data that you wrote into the system. Sometimes you can get corrupted data, sometimes you can get errors, and so on. So the contract is, uh, is much more precise now. Um, and therefore, now you have to model the recovery protocol in the top layer, the above layer, and then you can reason about the correctness, right, given this model. So some of the uh, benefits of keeping these layers separate and having this abstraction uh, they can still be preserved. It's just that there is a more precise contract between these layers now. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, completely. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just coming into land, um, I've, I've read, you know, Remzi and Andrea's OSTEP, you know, Operating Systems 3 Easy Pieces, that lovely textbook mm -hmm. with the comment on with the, the comment <laughs> on, on the front. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's one of my favorite computer science books. I wrote to Ramsey after reading it. I said, you know, this beats KNRC for me. This is now taken, <laughs> taken over. Uh, so I love OSTEP. And, you know, you, you got to, like, have Ramsey and Andreas, your supervisors, and work under them. And they've done a ton of research. So can you share, like, some of your special memories, you know, with Ramsey and Andrea? <laughs> can you take us behind yeah. the scenes at UW-Madison? <laughs> anecdotes. <laughs> and, uh, Ashura, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. So actually, for those of you who don't know, uh, Andrea and Ramsey are a married couple, and like, and Ram and I are also actually a married couple. So <laughs> we, it's really fun to do that. Uh, like when we four of us meet and we, like we work together, it's that I, I think we had like a special bond that way too. Like where like two married couples are like working on like common problems. So, uh, together and that was really fun. Like, uh, but other than that, uh, so Andre and Ramsey are really great. Like, one of the great things uh, is that when you come out of uh, the meetings uh, with them, you feel very energized. They they make you feel very good about the things that you have done, and that that makes you feel. Uh, like you have to work more and work more uh, and like solve all these hard problems. And so you come out motivated out of each of these meetings, right? So 
like I really looked forward to meeting with my advisors, right? Like maybe not many would say that, like probably they are like fearing, like meeting with their advisors or what I'm going to say to them when I meet them next week. But for me, it was actually the opposite. Like I used, I used to just look forward to the meetings with them because it's so much fun. We uh, And they also, uh, they show that like you can not only do serious research together, but you can also have fun while doing that. I think that was all another great thing that I learned from them. Yeah, for me, uh, same thing. I, I couldn't have asked for better advisors. And they are such fun people to work with. Uh, one interesting anecdote about uh, this particular paper, the protocol of free paper, was that I was I was really stressed out when I was writing this paper, and uh, I was just I just wanted to make it perfect. I wanted to make it uh, um, uh, make sure that everybody understood the paper uh, as we wanted them to, and uh, I was taking so much stress and then I was giving out drafts to Andrew and Ramsey to uh, for them to read and give me some feedback and then Ramsey actually I was working in my office Ramsey dropped by him and said like Ram um, just don't just don't stress out just go home uh, the paper is in a good shape uh, it'll be one of the best papers so just go just go home and uh, I was like no I want to make it perfect and I want to make it make this as good as possible and he was like, no, it's already good you should just relax and uh, it should be fine and that kind of like uh, Ramsey knows like uh, how to balance uh, like work and having fun. I've never seen such a person <laughs> who can do like such top notch research and yet uh, still have like a lot of uh, uh, fun in doing that. And yeah. uh, Andrea uh, for me is uh, such a student first professor in that like she wants the best for her students. Like in, in, during our initial years in grad school and I should and I would write papers and uh, Andrea, what she would do is instead of like editing the papers in the GitHub repo or wherever it is, uh, she would print out the paper and then she would use a red pen to fix all the writing mistakes. And then it kept on going and uh, we would start writing like maybe like a month before the deadline and then this would go on every day. And then uh, this happened for multiple papers and then we were like really surprised. Oh, this would actually take a lot of her time to actually read, print these papers. Fix those, write those things, and then she could very well go and write, uh, write it directly in the latex repo. And then later, uh, we kind of realized that uh, she was she was not aiming to do that. She wanted us to become the better writers. Uh, she wanted to uh, wanted us to uh, write well. And over the years, hopefully, all the red ins, the paper markings reduced, and then finally, towards <laughs> the final papers that we wrote, uh, our thesis <laughs> was free of red ink, I think. Um, so, which was kind of like really uh, uh, like showed how Andrea is interested in like making our students the best possible researchers that they can be, uh, which is kind of very inspiring. And that is one of the reasons that I should and I decided that we want to uh, go into academia and have like uh, students like Chaitanya and others uh, also do something uh, similar. Right? Um, yeah, uh, those are my really <laughs> support Andrea and Trinity. And they're, they're great people to work with. If anybody is, who is listening, who wants to grad, go to grad school, of course, yeah. we also do it, but, but <laughs> okay. uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, like one interesting anecdote is that somebody, some some grad student was actually applying to both um, UAUC and Wisconsin this time, and then um, he was talking to uh, uh, Ramsey uh, before going to committing to Wisconsin, and then Ramsey actually encouraged him to actually go and work with us, and then the final, the student is actually coming here this year, um, and uh, that just shows the, like <laughs> like their it... economy, um, yeah. So, yeah, that just shows they, that like how good people they are, right? Like yeah. they they actually look out for uh, their students even if they yeah. after they graduated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, well, maybe one day Tiger Beetle, we can come and be your students at last. Uh, <laughs> 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 we we do we do pay attention, you know, to all the little things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, let me bring us to land now. Um, so finally, uh, you must have learned a ton of valuable principles and lessons through uh, your uh, research tenure. Uh, what would your advice be to people designing new databases and distributed systems? And uh, where do you see the future of the fields going? Um, I, I would not pretend that I know that where the future is going to be for database and distributed systems. <laughs> I'm not that experienced to uh make that claim but i probably have like one uh, valuable lesson that i learned from grad school and research is 
for especially for graduate students who are working on systems research is that um, I think if you try to pick up problems uh, by doing things or by paying attention to real systems, uh, for example, things like uh, systems like Tiger Beetle, if you pay attention to what these real systems are doing, you will find some interesting problems that are also of practical importance. Um, as systems researchers, I think it is uh, it is very sort of important to have this uh, uh, practical relevance in whatever we do, right? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, like there is like deep work that you can do in theory uh, and other fields, but in systems, it's for me at least I feel it's much more. Uh, I feel energetic about working on like real problems in real systems. Um, so if there is a way for you to do that, I think I would encourage you to do that. Like study real systems, what they're doing and what are their shortcomings. And based on that, you can find a ton of problems that, that you can work on. And always measure these systems, like measure and uh, and then you can show the problems and then you can build to fix these problems. Yeah. This is exactly what we did in the, uh, the corruption line of work. Yeah, I I, com I completely agree with what Ram said, and like when you are uh, building these systems, and like uh, as Ram just said, like measuring is really important, and like also measuring one level deeper, right? Let's say you're um, measuring something and you're observing something, don't just trust uh, what you're observing. Do another level of deeper measurements to sort of reason about what you're observing, right? And this is very uh, a lot of. Uh, Famous systems researchers have said this, and I think uh, it also resonates with me very deeply. It, it's very important to measure one level deeper, and that gives you a lot more understanding about the system, uh, not just the system that you are sort of studying, but also the system that you are building. Right? Let's say you're setting out to building some uh, system, and you want to get some good performance, and you're getting that. Just don't be satisfied with that, but just measure one level deeper, and understand why you're getting that performance, and. Another thing that I actually really liked about uh, also Tiger Beetle is their simulation testing. Uh, so when we build our systems, we always uh, not just uh, you know tested the correctness uh, using like proved the correctness using paper and pen proof, or not just measured the performance. We, we also wanted to ensure that the system implementation is behaving in a correct way. So you, we would like inject faults and see how the system is behaving. And I think I am really a big fan of the simulation based testing that Tiger Beetle has done. So do those kinds of things as well to ensure that you're building like a correct system and measure one level deeper to ensure that you're understanding the performance deeply. Well, uh, also, I should let you know, you know, with our simulator that we did, we we made the simulator aware of protocol aware recovery. So we said to the simulator, <laughs> this system must maximize durability. So if there's a single sector mm -hmm. fault, it can't throw away the whole node because that undermines the other durability that the node still has, which is valid. So we must maximize mm -hmm. durability. We must be correct and we must maximize availability. If the cluster shuts down too early, that, that is an issue. So, And what was so amazing was that the simulator found cases where we didn't actually follow the, your paper like as closely as we should. And the simulator would say, well, you're not implementing protocol aware recovery. You're not optimizing these goals. Um, so just again, thanks thanks to you for such a stellar paper and such a pleasure to have you like that we could chat like this, go behind the scenes. Um, yep. um, thank you for lending us your your student, Tatanya, as our intern, uh, just as it happened, you know, and yeah, really such a pleasure. So thank, thanks. Thank you, Ashwarya. Thank you, Ram. This is... Uh... Thank you, yeah, Yoran so and Chaitanya, for hosting us. This is really our pleasure. And uh, yeah. we wanted to give uh, Tiger Beetle uh, a huge amount of credit because they, they pay attention to research uh, that's happening in academia. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's not benefiting just them. It's also giving us a lot of encouragement to work on these kinds of practical problems. Um, so thanks, uh, huge thanks for that. Yeah, oh. thank you so much, uh, Yoran. Thank you so much, Chaitanya. The, really had an amazing time and maybe yeah. we'll have like one follow up where we get to learn about like things that changed in tiger beetle from protocol recovery right like what are the changes that you made but that's again yeah. that's i guess like for a different 
yeah. interview. Yeah, we'd, yeah. we'd love that. We can, <laughs> we can show you. Actually, nothing changed. You know, protocol aware recovery was perfect. Perfect generic protocol. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so th thanks to you. The, the pleasure was ours. You know, huge privilege. You heroes of ours in storage. So this is a, a really, really special time for us. So thanks. And thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah.